good afternoon and good evening and good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Akio Hyodo. I'm from Japan. Oh, thank you very much, Raja, uh, for your kind in, uh, introduction for myself and also the first speaker, Professor uh, Bujinki uh, from the United States in the Mayo Clinic. And uh, I'm very honored to chair the first lecture at the endovascular management of intracranial hypotension uh, lectured by uh, Professor Brinjki. And, uh, you know, uh, the, I already uh, have uh, so many cases of endovascular surgery. But today's talk, today's Brinj uh, Professor Brinjki's talk, endovascular management of intracranial hypotension. Oh, what is that? You know, it's a, I think it's a you know, completely new concept. Uh, in the, our field, you know, the we treated all and uh, uh, you uh, already we treated a lot of cases the arterial venous shunt, but today he talked about not arterial venous shunt, maybe venous and uh, the central uh, CSF with shunt, cause and hypertension, intracranial hypertension. So I'm very exciting yeah, to hear his talk from now uh, because uh, I have almost no idea about that. Maybe almost the same level as the ordinary uh, audience like this. So <laughs> uh, actually the, after that, maybe I have many questions also uh, you know, the many audience have a uh, lot of questions. So, you know, I'm waiting uh, for that uh, the hot discussion after the pre his presentation. So, how about Professor Brzezinski? Uh, are you ready for your lecture? Uh, yeah, yes, I am. Okay, so please start your lecture. After that, you know, uh, I like to, you know, give you so many questions, <laughs> okay. Great. Yeah, and I, I'm definitely going to leave uh, uh, time for questions. I, I don't think I'll take the whole uh, 40 minutes since I'm just hoping to introduce the topic and kind of explain where it came from and, and some of the data. So, yeah, I'll, I'll be talking about uh, foraminal vein embolization for treatment of uh, CSF venous fistulas, which cause uh, spontaneous intracranial hypotension. Um, before I um, uh, go through with my talk, I want to just uh, give a little tribute to our team. Um, you know, everything uh, that happens in medicine is because of having great teams. Uh, and I'm very fortunate at the Mayo Clinic to have a world-class team of uh, neurosurgeons, uh, neurologists, and neuroradiologists who are working to uh, help in the diagnosis uh, and treatment of spontaneous intracranial hypotension. Uh, you know, just a, a little disclaimer, at least in the United States, um, this is an off-label indication for onyx. Um, these are my uh, disclosures. So um, the objective is to introduce the uh, concept of CSF venous fistulas, show how they're treated before 2020, uh, introduce concept of our foraminal vein embolization, and then just a brief uh, review of some of the spinal venous anatomy that we've recently learned a lot more about. So spontaneous intracranial hypotension is a disease that is well known to many in the neuro neurological, neurosurgical, neuroradiological community. Um, it affects typically middle-aged patients between the age of 30 to 50. Uh, it is more common in women. And the annual incidence, um, at least in our county, is a close to five per 100,000 patients. The clinical presentation of spontaneous intracranial hypotension, uh, primarily patients present with orthostatic headache. Uh, however, as they get more and more progressive brain sag and deformation of the cerebellum and brainstem, they can present with problems including gait disturbance, cognitive dysfunction, sensory neural hearing loss, and tinnitus, as well and ex as in extreme cases, coma due to depletion of CSF. 
Um, so intracranial imaging findings, uh, many of us are well aware of these, uh, engorgement of the pituitary gland and intercavernous sinus, uh, ventricular collapse in some more extreme cases, uh, dural venous sinus uh, engorgement, uh, de you know, effacement of the supracellar cistern, the prepontine cistern, decreased mammalopontine distance, cerebellar tonsillar ectopia, uh, bilateral subdural effusions or, or subdural hematomas, and then a dense pachymeningeal enhancement. So these are the typical imaging findings. These are seen in 90% of spontaneous intracranial hypotension patients. I will say though, that in a subset of patients, um, you know, about 10%, they do not have brain sag, uh, but they have the classic clinical symptoms. Uh, so normal brain MRI with clinical symptoms is a real thing uh, in this disease. So our diagnostic algorithm at the Mayo Clinic uh, for patients with spontaneous intracranial hypotension, after we get a brain MRI, we perform a whole spine MRI. And the whole spine MRI uh, is designed to answer one quick question. Do they have an extradural fluid collection or no. If they have an extra dural fluid collection, like you see here, and like you see here, then that means that they have a frank dural tear somewhere in the dura, probably due to an osteophyte or something. And these patients, um, we have them undergo a CT myelogram and these to uh, identify the location of the leak. And these patients have to be treated surgically, okay? If they do not have a frank dural tear, then they, they typically have a normal looking spine MRI. So if they have a normal spine MRI without, without an extradural fluid collection, then these patients, we have them undergo lateral decubitus digital subtraction myelography with the intent to localize a CSF venous fistula. So I think that there are basically two kinds of leaks the dural tear and the CSF venous fistula. The dural tear has the extra dural fluid collection and these patients have to undergo surgery to fix that, uh, to fix that uh, tear. Um, the patients without a dural tear, these patients have a CSF venous fistula and these patients can be treated with uh, endovascular surgery or open surgery as I'll talk about in a little bit. So what is a CSF venous fistula? I think many people are learning more about this, uh, but uh, I do not blame you if you've never heard of this before. So it's a direct connection between an intra the intrathecal space and a paravertebral or foraminal vein. Uh, and you can imagine it here where, you know, you have the vein that's, you know, around the nerve root sleeve and you have some sort of abnormal connection between the CSF space and the vein. Um, it was only described in 2014 uh, by a surgeon uh, in California uh, named Vauder uh, Scheivink, uh, but it's likely an under-recognized or elusive diagnosis. Interestingly, patients can describe the moment at which their symptoms occur, um, but the mechanism is still unclear. I think it may be due to the rupture of an arachnoid granulation uh, into the vein, because as many of you know, uh, along the whole spine, we have tiny arachnoid granulations in all of our nerve root sleeves that facilitate resorption of CSF. So I wonder if it's due to dysregulation or rupture of one of these granulations. Um, interestingly, as we've learned more and more about these CSF venous fistulas, we're, we're discovering them with increased frequency. So, you know, a review of cases from 2009 to 2015 showed that only two and a half percent of leaks were from CSF venous fistulas. But then we got better at diagnosing them. And now in 2018, we say, oh, wait, there were 25 percent of leaks are due to CSF venous fistulas. And then now we're learning even more. And, and uh, in our, our most recent experience at Mayo, um, over 70% of leaks are due to CSF venous fistula. So it's an increasingly recognized diagnosis as we get better at diagnosing it. So how do we diagnose them? So before you know 2018 at Mayo, we were doing uh, 
gadolinium myelography with positive pressure. Uh, so we used the positive pressure to provoke the leak. Uh, so we would inject 70 cc's of saline intrathecally in addition to a little bit of gadolinium to maybe expose the leak uh, and then also allow us to identify the fistula. And the diagnostic yield of this very invasive study that required intracranial pressure monitoring for a diagnostic study was 14%. So this is the best that we could do. CT myelography, the diagnostic yield was 7%. And these are patients that definitely have a leak. They have brain sag. They have the pachymeningeal enhancement. We were not finding the leaks in these patients. We were not finding the leaks. So then um, when I was a fellow at Toronto Western Hospital, uh, I learned uh, from Richard Farb how to do digital subtraction myelography. Uh, and digital subtraction myelography is a myelographic technique that requires the use of fluoroscopy, you know, one frame per second spinal you know, uh, angiography, and you have the patient in the lateral decubitus position uh, with their hips up and their head down. And it's a two day procedure. We do one day with the right side down and one day with the left side down. Uh, and with the digital subtraction myelogram, what we're looking for is as we inject the contrast, we're watching it go through each neural foramen and seeing does it escape from any of the neural foramina. So here is an example of uh, one of the first digital subtraction myelograms that we did. Um, and you can see how the contrast escapes the neural foramen and enters into the vein. Now, this is a very impressive case, um, just for allowing me to prove the point. But in many cases, the CSF fistulas are much more subtle. So you can see here how the contrast is leaving the spinal CSF space and then entering this dense network or this complex network of vasculature, which are veins. And you can see that it's pulsating uh, as if it's in a blood vessel and like the venous flow is pulsating the contrast away. So this right here is a CSF venous fistula that we diagnose on digital subtraction myelography. So again, you can see the contrast in the fecal space then in the nerve root sleeve, and you can see how the contrast exits and enters into the venous space. So our diagnostic yield, and these two articles are, you know, they're both open access, um, but our diagnostic yield for high probability patients uh, with digital subtraction myelography is 70%. So we went from being able to diagnose one in seven patients to now seven in 10 patients uh, that have definitive findings of spinal CSF hypotension. Surgery is a great option for these patients. So typically uh, when there uh, is a CSF venous fistula found, um, you know, uh, what we were doing was we would try a blood patch uh, first. Uh, now, blood patch only works worked in one in 40 patients. Um, so blood patch does not work in patients with CSF venous fistula. Um, then, uh, you know, if the blood patch didn't work, the patients went on to go surgery. So for surgery, our surgeon would do a little hemilaminectomy, uh, find the axilla of the nerve root, and put a clip uh, on it, and then also obliterate all of the veins in the foramen, Okay. Uh, and with surgery, closing the veins and closing the nerve root vein complex, uh, about half of patients were headache free and about a quarter of patients had 50% improvement of headaches. So outcomes were generally good. MRI findings, so those MRI findings I showed you earlier, reversed in uh, over 70% of patients, okay? So not only do we have subjective data, and I know people are concerned when it comes to headache, you know, patients improve, is a placebo effect, is it not? But we have objective data based on MRI findings that the brain floats back up and their, the structures become normal again. Um, but there are complications with surgery. I mean, the surgery, you know, patients can get uh, numbness, paresthesias, or burning in the dermatome of the nerve root that was taken. Uh, surgery requires longer recovery times. Rebound hypertension is a thing, uh, but that comes with endovascular treatment as well. These are cases that Dr. Scheivink from Cedar sinai showed me of CSF venous fistulas that he found uh, intraoperatively. 
Um, blood patch, as I talked to you about earlier, generally does not work for these patients. Efficacy rate is about two and a half to 13%. A lot of patients require lots of blood patches. So I was wondering, you know, could there be a better way? So during the early days of COVID, when we were shutting down our hospitals and saying you can't do cases, you know, um, uh, in, in, instead of going fishing, uh, I went and started, you know, looking at the myelograms, reading some of the literature, and, and just looking at, you know, trying to understand, you know, what's going on with these CSF venous fistulas. And I saw this CSF fistula coming from right T2. Uh, and I saw how it was going into a very large vein. And I thought to myself, this vein is very large. Um, it must be feasible to, you know, if we could identify what vein this is, it must be feasible to get into the vein, uh, potentially embolize it and potentially obliterate the CSF venous fistula. So I was looking for books on spinal, you know, angiography, uh, spinal veins to understand the anatomy better to see if there was a way. And I found this beautiful book from the 1970s called Spinal Phlebography. And spinal phlebography was a technique that was used prior to the advent of CT and MRI, where they would look at compression or displacement of epidural veins to diagnose disc herniations. Uh, and in the book, there were pathways and how to get into various veins uh, in the lumbar spine and in the cervical spine. Now, most CSF venous fistulas are in the thoracic spine, but that led me to do, you know, to investigate. And I found that, oh, it's actually very straightforward. Um, you know, in order to get into the thoracic spine veins, you just have to get into the azagous vein and you can get into all these veins. So the idea that I had um, uh, uh, pitched uh, to my uh, surgeon colleague and my neurology colleagues was for allow me to catheterize the azagous vein, do a venogram, and then get into the foraminal vein where the fistula was, and then embolize the vein with onyx. And I'll go over the anatomy in a second. So this is the anatomy of your typical um, azagous vein venogram. And this is for embolizing a T12 CSF venous fistula. So this is the AP view, this is the lateral. So here in dark blue, you see the azagous vein. In uh, light green, you see the paraspinal vein. So this is the vein going along the lateral margin of the vertebral body. Dark green, you see the foraminal vein, so the vein in the neural foramen. And then in white, you see the epidural venous plexus, the lateral epidural venous plexus. Now, the CSF venous fistula occurs somewhere here. So somewhere in the lateral epidural plexus, foramen, or in this uh, venous complex here. Um, and this is a venous network that surrounds the nerve root sleeve. So here, this is a uh, this circle is a circle that is surrounding the nerve root sleeve, and um, what you can imagine is that the nerve root goes through this circle right here and right here. So when I do the embolization, I like to get this, 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 and then a little bit of this, the paraspinal vein. So here is, um, you know, uh, and, and there's a nice article that is also open access for people to learn about the spinal uh, venous anatomy, the extradural spinal venous anatomy. But basically the idea is to take the catheter, go up the femoral vein, uh, go up the IVC, get into the azagous vein. And then from the azagous vein, you can reach anything on the right, most things on the left, uh, and including things uh, up here. It's a little more tricky for the ones that are in the cervical or upper thoracic spine, but um, we're learning that it's easier to get in there than, than we think it is. So here I'll show a case of uh, uh, embolization from start to finish. So I have a catheter, a six French catheter here, a benchmark, and then here I have a diagnostic catheter. The azagous vein is always the entry is right above the right main stem bronchus. So trachea, left main stem, right main stem, and this density here is the azagous vein. So I'm gonna play the video. And you can see here, I have my catheter pointed posteriorly uh, and I'm in inserting my wire um, into the azagous vein. And then once I have the wire um, in the azagous vein, I slowly advance my uh, diagnostic catheter um, 
you know, the video is a little bit jumpy. I think my, my internet's slow, but then once I'm in there, um, I'm able to do um, the venogram. So this is the, the venogram that I had showed you earlier and described the anatomy as well. So now that I'm uh, uh, in there, I basically insert a microcatheter um, into the vein that I'm trying to get into. So in this case, the vein is uh, right T12. Uh, and once I have the microcatheter uh, in position close to the neural foramen, I proceed with the uh, onyx uh, embolization. So you can see here that slowly advancing the wire, uh, you know, in the, the vein is right underneath the pedicle. So I use the pedicle as a landmark. Um, so there, right there, the wire is going medial. So that means I know that I'm close to the neural frame and the vein and the pedicle. So here's the tip of my microcatheter. And this is the venogram. So you can see I'm right there at the foramen. Here it is on the lateral. Um, and then here's the venogram. So you can see here, I'm right at the foramen. So now that I am happy with where I'm at, I'm going to do a venogram, which shows all the foraminal vein, the epidural vein, and that big circle. So I'm happy right now. And then, you know, sometimes I use a balloon catheter, sometimes I don't. But in this case, I did. I inflated the balloon catheter and then proceeded with um, onyx uh, uh, embolization. And the goal of the onyx embolization is to basically just fill all the veins in the neural foramen, the epidural plexus, and also to get that ring uh, right here that, you know, uh, the CSF can, can escape through. So here is this patient's CSF fistula. You can see here the nerve uh, 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 root diverticulum, the, the, the vein opacifying. Here it is again. Here's the venogram. So you see, you see there's the nerve, the, the foraminal vein, and then the paraspinal vein, and that's the onyx cast. So I know that I, I obliterated the fistula, okay? And this is what it looks like on CT afterwards. I have a ventral and dorsal uh, vein, a little bit intraosseous and some paraspinal. And you can see that this is that ring where the nerve root comes out of. So basically I've obliterated all the venous complex in that area. So our first uh, case series uh, was five patients that was published in AJNR. Um, we had complete resolution of symptoms and radiographic findings in four out of five patients, partial improvement in one. Uh, this was one of our first patients. And they had a subtle CSF venous fistula. This was their pre-op MRI uh, after embolization, post-op MRI, everything uh, normalized. Uh, another patient, larger CSF venous fistula, big vein opacified, pre-op MRI, decreased mammalopontine distance, decreased supracellar cistern. Uh, the pons doesn't look normal. Pachymeningeal enhancement after embolization, uh, complete normalization. Our updated series was our first 40 patients. Uh, the female to male ratio, not male to female, female to male was 29 to 11. Mean age was 57. Hit six score dropped. So hit six score is a marker of headache severity. 78 is the highest, 36 is the lowest, and dropped from 67 to 42. And then uh, patients, 90% uh, of patients reported improvement. And burn SIH score, which is a marker of severity of brain sag, dropped from six, uh, 5.7 to 1.3. Uh, local site pain was a common complication at the site of the onyx injection, about 30%. Rebound intracranial hypo hypertension. Um, occurred in 17.5%, and tiny onyx emboli to the lung occurred in a small amount of patients, less than 10%. Most of the lesions were on the right, uh, and most of them were on the right lower thoracic. Um, regarding symptom improvement, uh, we had headache improvement or resolution in a vast majority of patients that had headaches. Vestibulocochlear symptoms improved in also like close to 90% of patients. Cognitive function improved in 90% of patients. And the one patient that had a tax or imbalance had a resolution of that as well. Um, this is just showing like 
individual patients, you know, if, if they improve their burn SIH score and hit six score, and you can see that again, most patients had complete improvement. Some patients did not have headache. Uh, so they, you know, so hit six score is not a perfect uh, measure of, of outcome uh, because not every patient has headache. Um, and then, you know, I, you know, I, I, um, I don't know how much detail I want to go into spinal venous anatomy, uh, but this is an article that is uh, open access. Let me just, uh, I can unhide a couple of, of slides here um, and, then, and then we can, uh, um, I can just show, uh, I can just show some, some basic things. Um, cause I could talk for hours on this topic, but, but basically the extradural spinous anatomy is, you know, all of you are neurosurgeons. You're very well aware of this. I know, you know, but we have our epidural plexus, we have our foraminal vein, uh, and then we have this, uh, paraspinal vein, intercostal vein, and then we have inner segmental anastomoses between each level. So that's why when I embolize, I like to get all of this stuff here, the epidural, the foramen, uh, the paraspinal, a little bit of intercostal and intersegmental, because then you trap all of the routes of venous egress of the CSF venous fistula. Um, so, you know, again, this is just kind of another a graphical illustration of that. Um, you know, with the um, cervical spine, uh, the cervical spine is just a little bit different because the paraspinal vein is is much shorter. Um, so it's actually very easy, you know, to get into the foraminal vein directly off the vertebral vein. So like, you know, here I'll show this case, um, you know, where we have the cervical epidural plexus. So a subset of these patients, uh, like I mentioned earlier, maybe 10% are in the cervical spine. So for the cervical spine ones, you do not get into the azygous vein, you actually get into the vertebral vein. Uh, so what is the vertebral vein? It actually sits right next to the internal jugular vein, just posterior to it. Sometimes when you're doing a venous procedure, uh, your wire goes medial towards the vertebral body, that means that wire is in the vertebral vein. When you get in the vertebral vein and you do a venogram, there's a very, very, very rich plexus uh, in the cervical spine. Uh, and through that, you can reach all of the cervical levels if there was a CSF fistula there and even um, uh, get into the epidural plexus very easily. So I'm gonna show a case um, of, a, of a patient that um, I actually navigated through the vertebral vein in the cervical epidural plexus to get into a vein in the right lower uh, thoracic spine, which has typically been, been challenging. So let's see here. Here we go. So again, we're navigating our catheter up. Um, you can see here, uh, we're advancing the wire. We're trying to get into the right vertebral vein. So now we're in the right vertebral vein. So now that I'm in the right vertebral vein, I advance my catheter in, and then I do the venogram. And, you know, the venogram, let me just show that again. So for the venogram, this is the vertebral vein. Um, and then this is actually the cervical epidural plexus. And these are veins that go into each of the cervical uh, foramina. So then I advance my wire and I, I was trying to treat a fistula at right T2. I advance my wire into the cervical epidural plexus at C6. And the cervical epidural plexus is very large. So, you know, I was actually able to advance the wire all the way down to T2 through the cervical epidural plexus and out the neural foramen. And then once I was out the neural foramen at T2, do the venogram, and then from there, uh, proceed with the, the embolization. So before, you know, uh, for the ones in the upper thoracic spine, I was trying to get into the supreme intercostal vein, but it's a very hard vein to get into. So I learned that the cervical, the epidural plexus, the lateral epidural plexus of the spine is a very safe 
uh, an easy way to navigate. So if you're having difficulty getting to any level, you can actually get into the epidural plexus, a level above or below, and actually navigate you know, to any adjacent level. And this is here is the onyx embolization, um, you know, filling the epidural space. And, you know, so far we've done, you know, 150 uh, cases. Um, we've gotten lots of onyx in the epidural space. We have not had any compressive complications or anything like that related to it. So just a few, you know, things, you know, this is, you know, the technical, so the hardest part about management of this disease, number one is diagnosing it. Okay, um, finding the fistula, finding the leak. Okay, um, the treatment is fairly easy. Anybody who's doing brain AVMs, dura fistulas, spinal vascular malformations, will find this procedure to be um, uh, fairly straightforward, uh, rewarding. Um, the patients are going to be very happy. Okay, um, but there are some challenges. Okay, so number one. Uh, rebound hypertension. Okay, so rebound intracranial hypertension occurs whenever you treat a leak surgically or endovascularly, um, not whenever, but in 20% of cases. And typically these patients, you know, you can imagine somebody's had leak for a very, very long time, and the choroid plexus is producing the CSF uh, at a much higher rate to compensate for the leak. Then you close the leak suddenly, and then the patients, their choroid plexus is still producing the CSF, and they get intracranial hypertension. Sometimes the patients can manage it on their own. Sometimes they need diamox. In extreme cases, we've had to do venous sinus stenting um, or even uh, place a shunt, okay? Uh, typically patients that have had the disease for five, 10 years or longer, these are patients that get rebound high pressure. Um, many of these patients present with chronic subdural hematoma. So, uh, I, you know, have now started to do uh, middle meningeal artery embolization combined with the CSF venous fistula embolization in these patients. Multiple leaks, 10% uh, of patients present with multiple leaks. Um, uh, so these patients I've been, I try to embolize all the leaks in one setting. So sometimes patients have a CSF fistula left T6, right T12, you know, right C7. I try to do them all. Um, you know, I had one patient that had seven leaks, uh, seven CSF venous fistulas, uh, and I treated five in one day and, and two of the other. Uh, Long-term leak patients, so patients that have had a CSF hypotension for 10 or more years, I think, you know, they they don't get complete resolution of their symptoms, um, unfortunately. And I think that the chronicity of the brain sag leads the brain to get kind of stuck uh, where it's at. Um, and then I also think that they might get some meningeal sensitization, which is why they don't you know, get you know, complete headache uh, uh, resolution. And then what to do in failed embolization. So occasionally the embolization fails, occasionally surgery fails. So you know, if I um, embolize like T10 for a CSF fistula and they don't get better, um, the first thing I do is another DSM to see, are they leaking through T10 or are they getting, do they have a leak somewhere else? Because sometimes we see that happens. They find, they find a leak somewhere else, okay? Uh, and then I treat that. If I don't find something, um, then what I do is I embolize the level above and below where I previously treated with the idea that you've trapped any route of venous egress from T10. And about 80% of those patients have gotten better. So these are more advanced topics. Um, you know, as I've learned doing more and more, you know, the, you know, you get, uh, you know, you, you get uh, humbled the more patients you treat uh, and you learn a lot of things along the way. Um, future directions, we are uh, working uh, with the team on a randomized controlled trial of surgery versus blood patching. Uh, we're looking at uh, liquid embolic agents that are newer, not available in the U.S., and discussing a possible prospective clinical registry that's multi-center. Uh, thank you very much, and I'm, I'm uh, happy to answer any questions. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Benjike, uh, for your uh, Excellent, exciting, you know, lectures. 
uh, but you know, uh, we are not very familiar uh, for the you know, anatomy of uh, spinal cord and vertebra. So, uh, you know, re still a little bit uh, difficult for understanding, but you know, <laughs> there are many questions. <laughs> so uh, can we make, uh, can we have a uh, question uh, from now? Okay. Uh, yeah, yes, of course, of course. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, how about uh, Raja? Uh, the, 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 uh, any questions uh, from the audience or uh, web? Yes, we would like to interact and ask Professor Brzezinski questions. Mm -hmm. Mr. Brzezinski, okay. Brzezinski, one question I would like to put across first is like uh, all the patients that you showed in your series were symptomatic, right? In how many of patients had screened otherwise, you had found a fistula, which was asymptomatic. Have, have you had this in your experience? Yes. So um, we, uh, I, you know, we have not done the myelography on uh, patients that uh, are, are asymptomatic, right? But, but, you know, so one of the things that indicates on a CT myelogram, one of the things that indicates that there is a fistula somewhere is if you do a myelogram and then you do a CT right after, and there's contrast in the renal system, because the contra there's the contrast, if you put it in the CSF space, it should not enter the vas the vasculature and into the renal system within 20, 30 minutes. It takes a long time for that contrast to be resorbed. So if you see a dense renal collecting system, that means that there must be some abnormal connection between the CSF space and the, the, uh, the veins somewhere, okay? Now, when we looked at patients who got myelography done for orthopedic procedures, you know, in anticipation of, you know, spine surgery, and we, we do lots of myelography at, at, at Mayo, um, there was like, you know, maybe one in 500 that had contrast in the renal collecting system. When we looked at patients that had spinal CSF hypotension who got renal, who got uh, 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 um, uh, myelography, we found it in over 70% of patients. So I think that, you know, it's not normal uh, physiology. Got that. Okay. Thank you very much. Yes, Dr. Right. Hedo. Yes. Can I have a question uh, from now? Okay. Yes. Uh, Professor Vizinjitsky, uh, you know, the, do you have any idea uh, this pathology is it acquired or some congenital factor? I, I think it's acquired based off the fact that a vast majority of patients are presenting at middle age. Um, I think there's a congenital factor in that many of the patients have the meningeal diverticula also. So I think that in that sense, they have some sort of uh, weakness in their dura or collagen that must be congenital in nature. But, you know, I think that uh, it's acquired due to either some micro trauma, Valsalva, mm -hmm. something that's causing this diverticulum or rectum granulation to burst and then uh, fistulize with the vein. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the, uh, I'd like to ask uh, the another question. And uh, uh, as for the onicus embolization, you know, the, the, I cannot imagine the, what is the uh, first point to embrace, starting point uh, embrace, and then the last, I mean, the finishing. The, maybe uh, it depends on the, you know, the image, or I mean, the uh, image of an uh, venogram, but, you know, I cannot imagine. imagine. So do you explain the, the more clearly? Uh, yes, let me, I'll, uh, I'm going to share my screen real quick. Um, okay, so um, in, uh, in this, uh, so this is the, the venogram of, of yep. the patient, okay? So if I was, uh, you know, trying to embolize this area right here, okay? Mm -hmm. So this here uh, is ju the, Just uh, the near the shunting point, you mean? Yeah, so the shunting point... We, we can't identify exactly where uh -huh. the shunting point is on the myelogram. Um, however, uh, you know, the, the shunting point is somewhere in this area right here. 
And this is why the surgeon, when they treat it, they obliterate all the veins in the foramen and lateral epidural plexus. So when I do the embolization, I like to see the onyx here in the lateral epidural space, uh, here underneath the pedicle and the neural foramen. I like to have the whole ring, this whole ring filled with onyx. And then these little things here, the, you know, these are little branches uh, that are going into this, this ring. So I'll, um, so I'll show you the, what I like for the onyx cast. Okay. Yeah. So then this is a close up. So epidural plexus, the vein in the foramen, the ring, uh, and some of the paraspinal vein. And this is, this is a perfect onyx cast. There's lots of onyx in the foramen. There's some in the epidural plexus and there's some in the veins in these, these little veins here. Uh, but the azygos vein itself uh, should not be embolized. No, no, no. I, 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 I try to avoid reflux in the azygos vein because if you do yeah. that, some of the onyx can fly to the lung. Mm -hmm. But, it, you know, if you use two vials of onyx, you know, if a little bit of onyx goes to the lung, it's, mm -hmm. it's not a, a big deal. I see, I see. Okay, so... Uh, even uh, you know the uh, you make uh, uh, a final diagnosis. The uh, what is the final diagnosis? I mean the, the venography itself, or you know, venography is just uh, during the treatment. Yeah. So the venogram does not help you diagnose um, uh -huh. because the fistula is draining from the CSF into the vein, so you can't see anything in the venogram. The venogram will be normal on, on uh -huh. all the patients. Uh -huh. So the, the digital subtraction so myelogram, myelogram. Oh, is I the see. most important thing. So mm -hmm. the myelogram diagnosis, the venogram is, is for treatment, but we are treating blind. Like they say the fistula is at right T11. Oh. So I go to right T11 and I treat it there. Yeah, but uh, you know, the uh, digital subtraction myelogram, it's, uh, it takes uh, uh, two days, you mean? The, yeah, the <laughs> yeah, we're, we're, we're seeing if we can do it in one day. Um, uh -huh. But, you know, there are limits to how much contrast you can put uh, in the fecal space. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so you, now uh, you, you can uh, make a, this kind of uh, treatment. The, but uh, right now, uh, still, uh, do you do a blood patch or some uh, surgery? No, uh, if we if we find the fistula, we just I we embolize right away. I see. Yeah. So you believe that embolization is in the best treatment for this kind of disease? I'm I'm very biased, but yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. Good. Yeah. Uh, uh, Roger, uh, are there any other questions? Yes, there have been a few, but most of them have been answered in your lecture. But one in interesting question is that. Uh, do you observe a pers persistent fistula on imaging for unresolved cases? Uh, yes, I, I have uh, like four cases now where I saw a persistent fistula on a repeat uh, myelogram. And in, in those cases, I, um, I, uh, I treated the level above and below, and that was enough to stop the, 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 the fistula. Uh, if that doesn't work, then then surgery is always a, a great option uh, as well. But the patients, you know, you know, the patients, you know, every patient wants less and less invasive treatments, um, as many of you know. Okay. Yeah. Thank you right. very much for your excellent lecture so, and an excellent answer. <laughs> Maybe uh, you know, the, uh, in future. Uh, we like to do uh, like you know procedure. Oh, uh, I, I I I would love it. I would love to see okay, uh, okay. people all over the world doing it. So, so you are almost the time uh, to move on to the next session. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Bruce uh, uh, Brzezinski. Uh, thank you. So, so uh, uh, Raja, well, thank you. Uh, you to them. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Brzezinski. That was a wonderful lecture. And uh, I would like to inform our viewers that there are around 820 people who are live as of now on various channels in YouTube, Zoom, and of course, WeChat.
we are extremely thankful to professor shubin for broadcasting this on the wechat channel so it's now time to move on to the second session professor binjigi i guess you have the same lecture on the seattle science foundation as well best wishes for that thank you very much we have learned a lot and uh, we look forward to meeting you in person in future thank you very much thank Shihudu, you thank you very much so i would like to invite professor shiro horisawa to say a short yes. introduction and invite professor george matis professor horisawa all yours yes uh thank you for raja your great contribution to this uh opportunity and this wonderful uh, webinar I uh, saw so that uh, in this uh, letter of the symposium uh, in the, about the spinal cord stimulation, and the spinal cord stimulation is uh, uh, very effective for neurotoxic pain as well as ischemic pain, but it, it has been also been used to improve uh, motor recovery from a spinal cord injury. So I believe that this treatment uh, will become uh, increasingly uh, important treatment in the near future. So uh, the, the lecture, uh, today's lecture uh, will uh, be given by the Professor Mattis from Germany. The title is uh, Spinal Cord Stimulation, a Melody for the Brain, which is a very, very interesting title. So I'm really looking forward to hear uh, your great presentation. So Professor Mattis, uh, thank you for your uh, time uh, to give us a great lecture. So could you start your lecture, please? Thank you very much for your kind introduction. Thank you very much for the invitation. The first lecture today was excellent. Congratulations. And let me share my screen. I think you can see it. So let's start. My conflicts of interest, I must reveal everything here, but I don't think it's really relevant. The agenda, over the next uh, minutes, we're going to speak a little bit about neuromodulation because I'm sure there are colleagues uh, among us who never heard about neuromodulation, about the core, current role of spinal cord stimulation in interventional pain management, about new waveforms, and about the future of spinal cord stimulation. Let's start with the definition. Neuromodulation, what is neuromodulation? Is it all about cables or maybe not? If you visit the website of the International Neuromodulation Society, you will find there the following definition. Neuromodulation can be defined as the alteration of nerve activity through targeted delivery of a stimulus, such as electrical stimulation or chemical agents to specific neurological sites in the body. There are many diseases that could be treated with neuromodulation, among others, Parkinson's disease, essential tremor, medical refractory epilepsy pain, and this is the main topic of today's lecture, spasticity, urologic disorders, fecal incontinence, pelvic floor disorders, gastric disorders, and many, many more. But in my eyes, this is also neuromodulation. This is Bini, this is my dog. She is now eight months old. We adopted her from Croatia. And this is also a type of neuromodulation. And Bini, just like our chronic pain patients, needs much time and much dedication. What about the current load of spinal cord stimulation therapy? Which patients could be good candidates for such a therapy? We have patients with trigeminal neuropathy. Please be careful, not trigeminal neuralgia, trigeminal neuropathy. Patients with back pain, neck pain, arm pain, leg pain, phantom and stump pain, polyneuropathies patients with diabetes mellitus, for example, or after chemotherapy, patients with plexus lesions, with angina pectoris, with peripheral vascular disease, post-herpetic neuralgia, and complex regional pain syndrome with or without capsalgia. Yeah. So here, the train is the person. The man is the physician who is trying to remove all obstacles in the chronic pain journey of the person. It's not something easy to do, but we have to do it and we can do our best. So I think you got my point. And let me continue with a provocative question. What is it like to be a microhiropteron? Or otherwise, what is it like to be a bat? This was the title of an article published in 1974 in the Philosophical Review. It was about the consciousness, and the author Thomas Nagel wrote, these experiences 
for example, pain, hunger, also have in each case a specific subjective character, which it is beyond our ability to conceive. So pain is also very subjective. And it's the same thing with people who cannot hear us or see us. We don't really know what it's like to be like these people. And it's becoming even worse. This is the pain detect questionnaire, the German version of it. The patient should actually tell us how much pain he has. And he wrote these numbers down. Later on, it took five physicians to see that's actually the telephone number of the patient and not the pain intensity. The interventional pain therapy. There are many therapies, they are acting at different levels. So at the level of the first neuron, we have the dorsal root stimulation, we have the pulse radio frequency stimulation, we have peripheral nerve stimulation, the plantation of leads subcutaneously or peripheral nerve stimulation, implantation of leads directly where the nerves are. At the level of the second year, we have the spinal cord stimulation and the intratecal therapy with or without opioids or combination of these drugs. At the level of the third neuron, we have the motor cortex stimulation and deep brain stimulation. I think you are all familiar with the World Health Organization ladder. We should start our therapy with non-opioids, then use weak opioids, then stroke opioids, and in the end, the intratecal therapy. But we have seen that if we start with all these neuromodulation options, such as subcutaneous leads or pulse radio frequency or spinal cord stimulation, before even trying the opioids, then the clinical results are much, much better. And this is not what I'm saying. There have been publications on this topic. One of them is the article of Dr. McGuire and Dr. Slavin, 2020. And the authors are saying that actually now we have a trend or a paradigm shift toward an earlier surgical intervention. And this could have profound implications, not only for our patients, but also for the public health. Everything started with this article published in Science 1965, Pain Mechanisms, a New Theory. It is the well-known gate control theory, which states that the activation of large fiber fibers inhibits the transmission of pain to the brain. Once again, 1965. The first clinical application took place 1967, two years later. It was a patient with Prokhotsen carcinoma. His daughter was an anesthesiology nurse, and she convinced her father to accept this operation. It was experimental back uh, then. The patient accepted. He was satisfied. He had a pain relief, but six days after the operation, he died because of endocarditis. So the very first operation took 1967 place. This is not a new therapy. What are we stimulating? We are stimulating the dorsal columns. We are stimulating the dorsal horns. Actually, we have to implant one or two leads epidurally in the spinal canal, where the spinal cord is, make a test, a trial, and if the patient is satisfied, connect these leads to the permanent battery, to the permanent IPG, to the permanent implantable pulse generator. How it works? Nobody knows with certainty, although this is an FDA-approved therapy and a really old therapy. There are segmental spinal effects, but there is also a supraspinal modulating mechanism via descending pathways. There are many basic research articles published. You can find all of them in PubMed. There are many mechanisms. There are many hypotheses, but 100% we cannot be sure about this action. And this is why we are needing different types of stimulation. The history of this therapy in Germany, this is a photo from, coming from 1974. This was the first spinal cord stimulation meeting in Freiburg in the southern part of Germany. And all the devices you can see here are radio frequency receivers. They were devices. The colleagues back then implanted them under the skin subcutaneously. And each time the patient wanted to stimulate should place this round antenna over the radio frequency receiver. These were the very first steps. And we started, or the colleagues started back then with leads which get only one contact. Today, we have much more variety. We have leads with 16, 
with eight, with 32 contacts. Back then, we started with one contact, with two contacts, with four contacts. We have the percutaneous place leads, we have surgical leads, so the options are really big. It is true, and this is true for all therapies, that if we want to offer patients a good solution to their problem, we have to follow some rules. There are some indications, there are some contraindications, and some gray zones. And by the way, this is the University Hospital of Cologne. This is my home. In Germany, we have these S3 guidelines. There are inclusion criteria and exclusion criteria. The patient could be a candidate for this therapy if the chronic pain cannot be sufficiently treated with drugs or psychological therapy. Exclusion criteria, and this is more important, patients with severe coagulopathies, with mental disturbances, with addiction problems, with secondary gains, inability to use the spinal cord stimulation system, an advanced malignant tumor, and of course, infections in the area of implantation. According to the German Neuromodulation Society, the best two uh, indications for this therapy is CRPS type 1, complex regional pain syndrome, and failed back surgery syndrome, or the new name now, persistent spinal pain syndrome. Other indications, such as angina pectoris or peripheral vascular disease, the indication is open, or the recommendation is open, although the patients are really good candidates for this therapy. The majority of patients that are coming to us are persistent spinal pain syndrome or failed back surgery syndrome patients, patients that have been operated on in the lumbar spine, and after the operation, they keep having pain. And we know there are many articles on this topic that the failure rate of lumbar spine surgery lies somewhere between 10 and 46%. And that means that many patients are not satisfied. But we don't have only patients with back pain and leg pain. We have also patients with other diseases and other good indications, such as the intractable angina pectoris. Here we can place a lead with the tip at C7 or T1 on the left side. And if a heart attack is coming, the lead cannot hide this attack. So the patient is going to notice that the heart attack is there. This is a common question that people usually ask. Patients with peripheral vascular disease, the best patients are patients with stage 2B and 3, but some patients in stage 4 could be candidates. Here we should place a lead with a tip at T10 in the middle line for both legs. On the right side of the slide, you can see the temperature of the foot before starting the therapy control and 30 minutes after. You see the color is completely different. After 30 minutes, it's more red. Red means more blood is coming in this area, so we can improve the quantity of blood that is coming and we can improve the chronic pain. If you are interested in this topic, you could read our review article published in British Journal of Neurosurgery on spinal cord stimulation and PVD. Please keep in mind that spinal cord stimulation could be used at the same time or combined with peripheral nerve free stimulation. This is an example of a patient who had an accident, a bicycle accident. You can see where the problem was on the left picture. You can see the scar. Initially, the colleagues had implanted two leads parallel to the scar. The patient was satisfied. Six, seven years later, came back with an increase of pain. And then the colleagues implanted a second lead, a spinal cord stimulation lead. And now the patient has both therapy, spinal cord stimulation and peripheral nerve field stimulation therapy. The classical stimulation is the tonic stimulation, a paresthesia stimulation, meaning that the patients are feeling a tingling. They are having a tingling sensation. This animation comes from a specific company, but as you know, the company is... Chronic the pain can arise from numerous animation. conditions and have many negative impacts on a person's life. Hyperactivity of the wide dynamic range neurons, or WDRs, which project pain signals to the brain, is believed to contribute to chronic pain. The goal of spinal cord stimulation is to suppress this neural hyperactivity and therefore reduce pain signaling to the brain.
Treatment for chronic back and leg pain includes the use of traditional spinal cord stimulation, SCS, in which dorsal column fibers are targeted to reduce pain. Traditional SCS delivers strong low frequency pulses to activate these dorsal column fibers, generating paresthesia, a tingling sensation that must cover the patient's painful area. Obtaining and maintaining paresthesia coverage for back pain can be difficult, leading to poor long-term outcomes. HF10 therapy has been uniquely developed as a more efficacious and paresthesia-free therapy. Rather than stimulating the dorsal columns, it is believed to work by more directly targeting the dorsal horn, using consistent lead placement proximal to the painful spinal segments and a high frequency of 10 kHz. The result is greater neural inhibition and thus greater efficacy. So we have the tonic stimulation, we have the high frequency stimulation, we also have the burst stimulation. Here are packets of high frequency pulses delivered to the spinal cord. This is also sub perception, no tingling sensation. And we have now new waveforms. We have the possibility of frequency pairing, meaning that we can apply a tonic stimulation and then high frequency and then again high, then tonic stimulation and so on, or bursts and high frequency, and once again bursts, not at the same time, but sequentially. We have also the real combination therapy. This means if we have only one pain area, we can apply two waveforms, two types of stimulation, a tonic stimulation, for example, and a subperception waveform. If we have multiple pain areas, we can apply, for example, for back pain, a subperception waveform, and we can apply for leg pain, a tonic stimulation. We have also the possibility to try multiple therapies, multiple waveforms sequentially. The goal here is to address the issue of habituation, or in other words, the issue of loss of efficacy. We all know that in some patients, after some months or years, the pain is even stronger, and we'll have to adapt our stimulation to this uh, pain. This is why it's important to have many waveforms in order to address the issue of habituation. And this was the first neurostimulator that was implanted in Europe with the ability to offer this combination therapy. It was implanted in my hospital. Two years later, the MRI compatible version of the same neurostimulator, also in the University Hospital of Cologne, because it's important to offer to our patients a system that can provide different types of stimulation, but at the same time, the system should be also MRI compatible. This is what our reps are seeing when they're doing the programming. We're seeing the lead. We can adjust many parameters, the amplitude, the pulse width, the frequency. We can save different programs and do different combinations. And the concept here is that if we use different types of stimulation, we can at the same time stimulate the dorsal horns, we can stimulate the dorsal columns, we can stimulate different neural targets. And this could help in the long run for this habituation issue. This graphic comes from a publication from my department in neuromodulation in patients who came back to us after the implantation of the system, after some years, and they told us that uh, the pain is back. Instead of removing the system, we externalized the leads and we tried in all these patients the combination therapy. And we have seen that almost 90% of patients reported better clinical outcomes with a combination of multiple waveforms. Once again, it doesn't really matter what type of waveforms. What is really important is to have an option. A new technology, the closed loop stimulation. This article was published or was accepted in 2017 in neuromodulation. The concept here is that the lead does stimulate like all leads, but at the same time can measure the reaction of the spinal cord. How is that possible? The lead can measure and capture the ECAPs, the evoked compound action potentials. Compare the amplitude with a set point calculate a new stimulation current, and then generate new stimuli. Why is this important? 
the classical open loop systems, the lower part of the picture. We can see that the stimulation, the black line, is not always within the therapeutic window. It is important what the patient is doing. If the patient is studying or sitting or is supine, then the stimulation is different, meaning that the patient can get a hyperstimulation or a hypostimulation. With the closed loop system, you see that the stimulation, the black line, stays almost always within this therapeutic window. And what the patient is actually doing, if he's studying or sitting or doing something else, it's not important. An animation coming from the specific company showing the concept, we stimulate. Because of the stimulation, ECAPS are generated. The lead can capture these ECAPS and correspondingly adjust the stimulation. If you open your physiology book, you will see this picture here on the upper right corner with an ECAP with two positive waves, one negative wave. In the operating room, we see this picture here, the orange picture. This is a new, very promising therapy. There are results, clinical results. There is a study, Avalon study coming from Australia with 12 months results. We have an Evoke study coming from the United States with 12 month results, all of them published in very good journals. And now we have also for both studies, 24 month results. To make our life easier, I made up this uh, table to show you the results. So more, at least 50% pain relief, back and leg pain, after two years remains pretty good. What about the profound responders? Patients who have more than 80% pain relief. It is also really good. For me, it's more important that the stimulation stays within this therapeutic window. And maybe this is the reason why the results are so good even after two years. And even more important, we have 67 to 83% of patients, depending on the study, who eliminated or reduced the opioid intake. All of these studies, you can see the sources are published in really good journals. And this is how it looks in real life. The leads have 12 codecs, meaning we can cover almost three vertebral bodies. During the first four weeks, we use the open loop, the classical stimulation. And when the impedances are stable, after four weeks, the patients are coming back to our outpatient department and we change to the closed loop stimulation. Another waveform or another algorithm is this differential target multiplexed, meaning that with this algorithm, we are using multiple signals for modulating not only neurons, but also glial cells. Is this important? Yes, it is important because glial cells are involved in various processes. They are involved in neuroinflammation, they are involved in amplification, modulation, and distortion of afferent sensory signals, and they outnumber neurons in a spinal cord with a ratio of 12 to 1. There are publications that have been conducted, uh, research conducted on animals showing that results with DTM are better as compared to the results with low and high frequency. There are results in humans showing that the back pain starting from 7.4 is down to 2.4 and leg pain from 6 to 9.4. This is the neurostimulator that can provide this algorithm. One should keep in mind that the onset of action comes not immediately. It could be some hours, it could be up to two days. And the placement of the lead is really important. With two leads, we should cover the T8 to T10 space. And we have four programs that are running parallel. We have a basic program with 50 Hertz, and we have three prime programs with 300 Hertz. You got the point, we have many waveforms. Is that important? And if yes, why? This is Alma Deutscher. Some people think she's the new Mozart. She loves improvisations. Have a look at the video. Notes. If you could pick some four notes from this hat, um, and then I would improvise a piece based on the notes. All right, hand me that then. Close my eyes. Close, yes, close your eyes. 
The album says the most important thing in music is the melody. It does not need to be very complex, but actually people should like to listen and enjoy it. So, for me, spinal cord stimulation is music, is mathematics. The definition of music is the science or art of ordering tones or sounds in succession, in combination, and in temporal relationships to produce a composition having unity and continuity. And this is really relevant to all these weapons that we are using now in spinal cord stimulation therapy. I'm coming from Greece. I must say something about ancient Greece. So in ancient Greece, music was called originally any artistic or intellectual pursuit and was associated with mathematics. So a little bit of philosophy is also good. And we do know that if we use different waveforms, we can stimulate different areas in the brain. This was uh, shown and uh, presented at NANS, North American Neuromodulation Society meeting 2015 with tonic stimulation and one kilohertz stimulation. So different waveforms are acting in a different way. It's a different type of music for our brain. The second reason why the majority of these waveforms is important or the big, the more options we have with waveforms is really important is that we could not do the screening trials. There have been some publications, most of them are coming from the United Kingdom and COVID has played a tremendous role. This is a very interesting publication from Duarte and uh, Thompson. And they showed that if the success rate of a trial, when we are using rechargeable systems, systems with batteries, is 85% or more, or 55% if we are using non-rechargeable systems, then it is effective not to do a screening trial. And the colleagues are saying that if we do the trial, we could have more infections, we could have more punctures, productivity losses. And the main question is, are trials really predictive of long-term outcomes? To be honest, I would always do a trial. It doesn't matter if I have 10 different waveforms, I would also do a trial. But this is another trait in specific countries, we should respect it. Another very interesting article published in Pain from Professor El Dab and, and his team was this one, showing that the sensitivity of a screening trial is 100%, but the specificity is only 8%. And the authors conclude that although a screening trial may have some diagnostic utility, it provides no patient outcome benefits. What about patients with virgin pack, patients that do have back pain or back and leg pain, but they have never been operated before. This is a study conducted with 10 kilohertz as a frequency, and we saw that after 12 months, the back and leg pain is much better. More importantly, the OSVS disability index or the severe disability is much better, and the morphine milligram equivalents are even more better. The future. Where are we going to? While spinal cord stimulation could play a role. At this time point, it's a good option for patients with comorbidities, for cosmetic reasons, if the patients would like to have only this system, and if the patients don't really like bulky neurostimulators. With the wireless system, we plant only a lead epidurally. We don't implant a battery, but it's time the patient wants to stimulate, should wear this blue antenna 
over the skin, over the lid, and this transmitter. Without the antenna, the therapy is not working. This is how the lid looks like. This is once again how the antenna and the transmitter looks like. Of course, the main advantage is that the volume of the system is really low, less than one cc, when the smallest IPG in the market has a volume of 14 cc's, but there are some limitations. The future is also more data. If you have some time, you can read my tutorial in Interventional Pain Medicine and Neuromodulation Journal. We all have smart watches, Apple watches, we have many apps in our phones. All of these things can collect various data and artificial intelligence or machine learning can use all of this data to optimize or to improve the spinal cord stimulation therapy. All companies are working in this field. I'm sure that in the future, we're going to have even more waveforms, and this is a good thing. The newest thing that we have is the fast, the fast acting subperception therapy, a waveform subperception, 90 Hertz frequency without any tingling sensation. And the good thing here is that the pain relief comes within seconds or minutes when it works. And let me take you one step further. It seems that the newer waveforms can partially help patients with mixed pain, patients with a combination of neuropathic and nociceptive pain. This poster was presented at the European Federation of Pain Congress in Dublin this year, showing that people with a mixed pain syndrome could benefit uh, from this uh, waveform. It's about the fast wave. Professor Warren Grill of Duke University recently explored the impact of surround inhibition on SES. Here's how it works. In the gate control theory, small sensory fibers send pain signals to the wide dynamic range or WDR neurons, which are then transmitted to the brain. Conventional SCS activates larger sensory A beta fibers from the center area of pain. These fibers activate inhibitory neurons, which limit WDR firing and immediately reduce pain, despite also causing some WDR excitation. Conventional SCS also activates some sensory A beta fibers from the region surrounding the painful center. These fibers only engage inhibition without exciting the center WDR neuron providing additional immediate pain relief. Using the proprietary Illumina 3D algorithm, we're able to more precisely target the optimal location, covering more of the surround fibers. Combining Illumina 3D targeting with the proper neural dose and a unique active recharge waveform, FAST is designed to preferentially engage these surround fibers while minimizing center excitation. As a result, Patients can experience profound paresthesia-free pain relief before they leave your clinic. Just one more option. An interesting publication from many European colleagues, it's all about referral and selection of patients. Based on this publication, a company has made up this uh, website, the eHealth tool. It's free. You can uh, register there. And there are some questions we should give some data of your patient about his pain, about his history or psychological data. And the system will make a recommendation if the patient is a good or a bad candidate for spinal cord stimulation. Actually, this website could be of value mainly for general practitioners, but it is a start. The point here is to raise awareness about the therapy and motivate colleagues, general practitioners, neurologists, and anesthesiologists to refer patients to colleagues that are performing these spinal cord stimulation therapies. The future could also be this merge reality. Merge reality means blending to real-time video streams into a collaborative interactive environment. An example, this is me. I had an accident one year ago. Imagine I would, do, I would like to do a reprogramming. I have difficulties. My rep, who is an expert in this field, uh, is in Greece, somewhere in the beach. He can see what I'm seeing, and he can show me in my mobile phone what I should do, how I should program it. It's a big help in some cases, not for all patients. What's new, you will see many companies 
speaking about this is this remote programming. Remote programming could be a solution in some countries, in some cases, but according to my opinion, it should not be the mainstay. Nonetheless, it's a good option to have, and we use it also in my department. Here you can see me, but also you can see two reps from a specific company. The one is in the hospital, is with the patient. The second one is in Greece, having a good time, and we can talk all of us together at the same time with the patient, and we can see all together what would be the best programming option for this patient. And let me tell you, the patient is very satisfied. As you already mentioned, spinal cord stimulation could be used for patients with paralysis, complete or incomplete paralysis. This is a really, really good article published in Nature Medicine, and one of the authors would be in the International Neuromodulation Society, International Congress in Mind, Barcelona, and present his work uh, there. But please let me tell you, we are just in the very, very first steps of this therapy. We should not have huge expectations. An integral part of the whole concept here is the rehabilitation. It plays a huge role and the lead, of course, helps. So once again, we are in the very, very beginning we must wait a few years to get much better results, but it's really very promising. So when I was a kid, we didn't have internet, but we did have TV. One of my favorite things was Motor Times with Charlie Patton, an old movie. Charlie Chapman was working in a factory, and every day he should do the same repetitive movement. And when somebody doing the same thing, there are complications. The patients are not products. There are patients, they have different needs. This is why it is imperative to have many options, many weapons, if you like, in this spinal cord stimulation therapy in order to offer the best possible option to each person. We are speaking about an individualized therapy without such complications. Above all, spinal cord stimulation or treatment of chronic pain patients is a teamwork. It's not a one-man show. It's not about a surgeon who is implanting one or two leads. It's about a whole team of neurologists, neurosurgeons, orthopedic surgeons, psychologists, anesthesiologists, and so on. Of course, compassion is an integral part of the whole therapy, something that's uh, absolutely a must. A collaboration, a national collaboration, international collaboration is always a must. This is, I'm very happy to be here today with you. We can all speak together about this therapy and raise awareness about this therapy. I would like to thank my sales reps from different companies that helped me to do the optimal programming for each patient. And as you can see in these pictures, we are really having fun together. It's not only a job for us. So I hope that the chronic pain patients that could be good candidates for this therapy would find the way to this therapy and in the end be exactly so happy as my dog when I'm getting back home. If you would like, you could follow the official uh, social media accounts of the neuromodulation technology, the neural interface. This is the official journal of the International Neuromodulation Society. If you have not already registered, I think it would be a good idea to register for this Congress here in Barcelona in the end of May. It's going to be an amazing Congress. I hope to see you many, many of you there in this Congress. And with that, I finish my presentation. I thank you once again for the invitation. Should you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask me. Or if you want, just send me an email. My email address is on this slide. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for Dr. Mattis, uh, Professor Mattis. Uh, it's a great lecture. And uh, I totally agree with the uh, music and the mathematics and the uh, spinal cord stimulation. I now understand why is it difficult to understand uh, the principles and the effects of the spinal cord stimulation because I am not good at both music and mathematics. But uh, today's lecture was very educational to, and very easy to understand. So, and thank you very much for your great lecture that gave us uh, 
a very broad understanding of the basic principles of the spinal cord stimulation and uh, its future perspectives. So, uh, is there any uh, questions uh, on the audience? Yes, yeah. Uh, thanks, Professor Mahamatis, for very nice uh, uh, and uh, uh, very, very nice videos uh, and uh, on, on how a neural uh, modulation works. Uh, my question is, uh, in your experience, uh, is there a moment that we can actually uh, win off the device and uh, uh, the neuromodulation effect will be permanent? Do, do you experience such uh, occasion? And uh, my second question, uh, prof, uh, how do you uh, balance uh, between medication and, and uh, spinal cord stimulation? Uh, how do you, uh, the effect of both? Thank you, Prof. Thank you for the questions. Let me start with the second question. I'm afraid I couldn't hear your first one. You will have to repeat it. But it, for the second... It's uh, connected. Is it Prof. Matis? I cannot hear Professor? your voice. There are interruptions. I cannot hear you well. I heard only the second question. Yes. Only for a second question, please. For the second question, you can write if you want. You can write the first yeah, question. The first question, question Professor? Both, it would be easier. Yeah, I mean... So, for all patients... All patients should uh, try all the traditional uh, ways, should take medications, should try physiotherapy, should try psychological support, cognitive behavioral therapy, and all of these things. But if they see that this doesn't work out for them, they should not wait 20 years to find another solution. There are publications that uh, show that if we offer this therapy within the first five years after the onset of pain, the clinical results are much, much better. After this time period, the results are also good, but not that good. This is why I think it's a reasonable time period of five years to decide if the conventional management is enough for a patient or uh, not. And in order to be honest as well, the spinal cord stimulation is not the only therapy. It should not be seen as the only therapy. It's only a part of the therapy, meaning that after the implantation of spinal cord stimulation, most probably the patients are going to need some medications, but not so much as for before the operation. They are going to need physiotherapy sessions. They're going to need psychological support. As I said, this is not a one-man show. It's not a one-man uh, therapy. It's only a part of the therapy. And this is where we have difficulties when we're speaking with the patients because they have too high expectations. We are trying to reduce these expectations pre-operatively, not after the operation, but still the expectations are so high that the patients are not really hearing what we are saying. Most patients will need after the operation medications, hopefully no opioids. Some other medications could have adverse effects as well, but not the very high doses of uh, them. So once again, this is really important. The patient should try everything else, medications, physiotherapy, psychological therapy, everything else. But if they see after three, four, five years that no substantial pain relief is there, then they should not wait any more, any longer. The next step is in neuromodulation. Would you be so kind to ask once again the first yeah. question? Yeah, my, my first question, uh, have you ever experienced uh, the neuromodulation effect uh, became a permanent effect where you doesn't need a further neuromodulation. Does it cause a, a permanent effect? Thank you, Professor. This is a really, really good uh, question. I'm sorry I didn't hear it in the first place. Uh, there are such patients, but this is the minority. We are speaking about, let's say, 5% of the patients, not more. I have the privilege to work in this department where neuromodulation actually started here in Germany. So I, ha I have the privilege to see patients who have been operated 20 years ago. And there are patients that are coming back, they're asking us to explant the system. And when we are asking why, are you, are you not satisfied with the therapy? And we are waiting to hear loss of efficacy, habituation. They say, no, we're really satisfied, but we don't need anymore. We don't have any pain anymore. But if we look up the history of the patient, we see that in such patients, the colleagues back then offered this therapy very early. 
And I think this is the crucial uh, point. I have never seen an explanation because a person was satisfied by patients who had this therapy 10 years after the onset of pain. I did see some patients who tried spinal cord stimulation in the first two, three years after the onset of pain. This is, time is crucial. In stroke, we say that uh, time is brain, but also in <laughs> chronic pain management, time is also pain relief. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you. Okay, uh, I have uh, several questions, Professor Mattis. Okay, so the, the waveform of spinal cord stimulation is a little bit complex and difficult to understand. And uh, in uh, what order are the waveforms used? So do you start uh, the tonic stimulation at first, always? Or I, I, for, for uh, the conventional neuropathic pain? Thank you. Uh, I will rephrase the question. I will... Uh said in a little bit different. The most important thing is to do a really good intraoperative trial. This is personally, I do not agree with my colleagues in the United Kingdom who are saying no trial, just implant the system if the education is okay. I'm working in such a setting, it's a university hospital. I have the time and this is a luxury to do a very good intraoperative uh, testing, meaning I can, in the majority of the cases, not in all patients, but in the majority of the cases, I can cover the painful area with this tingling cessation, with paresthesias. And this is, for me, a prerequisite for the success of this uh, therapy, for the immediate success, but for the long-acting effect of the therapy. If I am sure that I have covered the painful area with the paresthesias, then I can be pretty confident that also in the future, using other waveforms, I could get uh, exactly the same good results or even uh, better. Nobody knows which waveform is the best for its patient. This is why it's good to have a system which provides all these types of stimulation, but also that we as a surgeon or anesthesiologist who is doing the surgery, that we plant the leads in such a way that in the future we can take, make the most of all these waveforms because there are some prerequisites for its waveform. There is a specific uh, way to implant the leads in the spinal cord. This is not only the art of the surgeon, it's also science. And the trick here is to implant the leads in such a way that you can have a good coverage of the pain area, but at the same time, all other waveforms, subperception waveforms can also be applied. And don't forget there are patients that are needing a combination of these waveforms. Don't forget also that there are patients that are coming after some years, they say, my pain is back. One option could be to switch off the stimulation for three to six months. It's a reset. It's the same what we're doing with the computers. It's exactly the same. In some patients, after some months, the spinal cord is responding to the stimulation. Once again, it's Holy. In the intratecal therapy, we are speaking in the baclofen therapy about drug holiday when we empty the pump and we don't use any baclofen for some uh, weeks. This is also, if you like, an electricity or a stimulation holiday for some time, no stimulation, then it starts working. If these approaches are not working for the patient, then one should try with different waveforms. In the majority of cases, it works, not in all patients. And this is the challenge. This is why all the companies, all physicians should keep working in this field till we find such waveforms that can uh, cover the needs of all patients. So there is lots of work to do. Okay, thank you. So, and uh, I, I think uh, the spinal cord stimulation is the most effective for ischemic pain, uh, such as uh, AS or other ischemic pain can be dramatically improved. However, uh, in Japan, cardiologists do not understand the spinal cord stimulation, and it's very difficult to convince them of its uh, usefulness. So this is why spinal cord stimulation for ischemic pain is not performed very often in Japan. So what, what is the situation in your country? If it makes you feel a little bit better, it's the same story here in Germany. The cardiologists, if we're speaking about angina pectoris patients, or the vascular surgeons, if we're speaking about PVD, peripheral vascular disease, are not really cooperative. 
although we showed them the studies, we showed them the clinical results, we sent them patients with a spinal cord stimulation system to see the effect of the therapy. It doesn't really work uh, well, but it's a pity because with this spinal cord stimulation, especially for patients with critical lip ischemia, you have a therapy for the vessels to improve the diameter of the vessels. You can offer pain relief. And just in case the patient has an amputation, you have already the lead in the spinal cord. You can treat stump pain and phantom pain. So you have, with one lead, four therapies. But we have exactly the same problem here. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. So, at the, so we do not have any questions at this moment. So, okay, so the, I would like to finish this session. So thank you for Professor Mattis, a great lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Professor uh, Mattis and uh, Professor Horisawa uh, for sharing this session. So uh, before ending, uh, on behalf of, of Education Committee of the SNS and President Professor Yoko Kato, I would like to thank both speakers of today, Professor Walid uh, Brigigi and uh, Professor uh, Georges uh, Mattis, as well as our Chair, Professor Akio Hodel, and also Professor Ashiro Horisawa for the time and support for the SNS webinar. I, I would like also express my sincere gratitude to Professor Zubin for broadcast. Uh, Raja, I mentioned we have more than 800 uh, participants from all uh, different three different channels. So until we meet again on Saturday, it's bye-bye from all of us. Thank you, Professor, for joining. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>